I want to pray for you right now that God would open your heart, open your mind to hear the word of God here today. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we get to come into this place and sing these beautiful songs to you and about how we love you, God. And we just pray in the next few minutes now that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray that great hope would rise up in our hearts and minds, Lord, while also being informed of what's going on in the great nation that we love so much today. We pray, Lord, you'd be glorified and honored by what happens in the next 45 minutes. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the return of the gods. Is it possible that behind the events, moments, and changes that are transforming America and the world and affecting our lives is a mystery? Could this mystery go back to ancient times, to the incense offerings of ancient Rome, processions of ancient Babylon, the tablets of ancient Assyria, and ceremonies of ancient Sumer? Could there be more to the news and what's happening in the world than what you see with your eyes? Tens of thousands of people condemning the Supreme Court's decision to overturn a landmark ruling on abortion rights. Just moments ago, the Supreme Court and this landmark ruling, the court uh, making same-sex legal, same-sex marriage legal in this country across every state in this nation. Enter into an entirely new realm of mystery as you are taken on a journey from the temples of ancient Mesopotamia to the halls of American government, uncovering the mysteries of the gods. Who are the gods? What exactly are they? And is it possible that these ancient entities have returned to the modern world, and specifically, America? Are they right now transforming our culture, our lives, our children, America, and the world? Did this mystery even determine the rulings of the Supreme Court and the exact dates they were handed down as their ancient sign appeared all over America and the world? Did an ancient god actually manifest on the streets of New York City? What is the Dark Trinity? Who is the Possessor, the Enchantress, the Destroyer, and the Transformer? Where is all this heading? What does it have to do with you? And what do you need to know in view of what's coming? A man touched down on the moon. A wall came down in Berlin. A world was connected by our own science and imagination. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. Take a look and you'll see into your imagination. We'll be the spin traveling in a world of my creation what we'll see will defy
fewer score and seven years ago. just crashed into the World Trade Center. I'm on the 83rd floor. We're on the floor and we can't breathe. Okay. It's very hot. I don't okay. see any air anymore. Okay. All I see is smoke. Okay. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Ma'am, 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 say your prayers. America, we have come so far. We have seen so much, but there's so much more to do. So tonight, let us ask ourselves, if our children should live to see the next century, what change will they see? What progress will we have made? This is our chance to answer that call. This is our moment. This is our time. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Since I was a small boy, two words have been added to the Pledge of Allegiance, under God. Wouldn't it be a pity if someone said that is a prayer? And that would be eliminated from schools, too. Jesus? We need you. Jesus, we need you. That is a cry of a generation. What you just watched was a human video entitled American Manifesto. The history of our country manifests each and every action that caused it. And it ends with a generation crying out to God. A generation that's seeking all the right things, just in all the wrong places. A generation that's desperate for a real encounter with the power of the living God. I'm very excited for the word this morning. Since I believe not only is it a word that the Lord gave me, but it's a word that needs to be spoken now more than ever. There are forces of darkness and evil that have been hidden for a long time, causing chaos and mayhem in our world that God will bring to light and he's dealing with right now. This message was inspired by the book Return of the Gods by Messianic Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. It's not by accident or coincidence the things we're seeing in culture. 
We didn't just randomly get to a point in American society where people are gender confused, where people are violent and polarized against one another, that divorce rates and crime continues to skyrocket. These things have been creeping in on the hearts of men and women over the course of decades, and we're now seeing it manifest before our very eyes. Even people who don't believe in God have experienced a wake-up call to what's happening around us. They're saying, this is wrong. This is insane. And some people are even saying, this is demonic. A lot of us might be thinking, where'd this come from? It it sprang up out of nowhere and now hit us smack dab in the middle of the face. I believe that the answer a lot of us are seeking behind all this madness that we see in America today, all these things have been happening to transform America, lies this ancient mystery that can be traced back to ancient Babylon and ancient Israel. What if those spiritual forces that we kind of look at as fictional characters or we blow off as hypersensationalism, what if they're real? What if we could identify those gods of ancient times in modern day America? What if those ancient gods returned to modern day America? Could they be the invisible agents that have been transforming our country? What if they lie behind what's happening to our children, to our families, to our country, and even to our faith? Friends, whether we realize it or not, we're in a fight. And the Bible defines this struggle as something spiritual. It's found in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Paul says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not against humans, but it's against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for this word. I thank you that you'll speak through your servant, God, that as my mouth opens up, your word comes out with the power to heal, correct, and to rebuke the darkness. I pray the hearts of those in this crowd can receive your word, that they might act upon it. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. amen. The title of this sermon this morning is called Same Demons, Different Day. Same Demons, Different Day. Another title I was working on was Same Garbage, Different Day, but I figured the first one was more church appropriate. Can I get an amen? The point of this message today is not only to inform us of what's happening, but also to strengthen God's people because this affects each and every one of us. If we're in a fight and we don't know who or what we're fighting, the odds won't be in your favor. Friends, you can never fix what you do not see. If you don't perceive something to be wrong or broken, then you will never feel the need to fix or change it. If I can't identify the problem or identify the issue, I'll be of no use in fixing anything since I won't know where to start. Also, if we're in a fight and we don't know how the enemy fights, we're at a disadvantage. Modern day sports team will spend hours of their time watching the film of the other team, watching how they play, watching how they prepare, watching their tendencies, their habits, and trying to find a weakness. Sports teams understand the need to find out the enemy. Because if we don't find out how the enemy's fighting us, it makes overcoming them much harder. So today I want to expose who this enemy is and what his agenda is. Author Jonathan Kahn, a terrific biblical scholar, described it as a threefold mystery. In ancient times, dating back 4,000 years ago, all over the world, people worshipped pagan gods or spirits. All nations, but the nation of Israel. Israel worshipped the one true God, Yahweh, Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Israel was a light to the world. The Israelites set a standard of living and a standard of how society should act that the rest of the world would compare itself to. Because Israel honored God, God blessed them. God's sovereign hand was upon the land of Israel. His favor rested upon them. But it wasn't long before the people who possessed the promised land became a land of possessed people. That the people can occupy a land, but someone could occupy those people. That despite receiving great blessing from God, they opened themselves up to spiritual forces that corrupted them from within. So what is this mystery? Well, the first part of this mystery is the ancient world was filled with many gods. No matter what civilization you live in or have researched, whether it be China, India, the Middle East, Africa, Australia, all peoples of these regions worshipped spirits and gods. What these people were worshipping is not the same as our God. It's not capital G, letter God. It's not Jehovah. But it's what is known as the Shadim. Shadim is a word that simply means a spirit with a free will a consciousness that seeks to go against the ways of God. We see this exact word used in scripture in Psalm 106, verses 34 through 37. King David himself writes, they did not destroy the people as the Lord commanded, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices, served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and daughters to the demons. The word shadim was translated by Greek into the Greek word daimonion, which is Greek for demon. The Shadim are synonymous and are better known as demons. 
The Apostle Paul himself writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 10, 20. No, I imply that what pagans sacrifice, they offer to demons and not to God. I do not want you to be participants with demons, he says. Paul was writing on the subject matter of eating food sacrificed to idols, but he warns the church of the nature and the reality of the demonic realm. Paul was saying demons are real and they're alive and they seek to destroy the work of God, so have no part with them. We see demons mentioned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see there seems to be these same demons in a different day. This is the first part of the mystery. There are, spirit, there are agents of darkness that seek to turn people away from God to themselves. These demons, these false gods, want to be worshipped in place of God. They have pride before God and seek to be honored themselves rather than honoring God themselves. The second part of the mystery. If the ancient pagan world was indeed overrun by demons, then there would be signs or examples of them manifesting in people. When you look at this godless worldly culture of our world back then and also today, we see signs of possession all over. The Bible records in the Old Testament that King Saul was tormented by a demon. It drove him suicidal and homicidal. It wasn't until King David would play a melody on his harp that the demon would leave him alone. We see again in the New Testament in the Gospel of Mark chapter 9 where Jesus heals a young boy from demonic possession. This demon caused the young man to be mute and would cause him to have seizures and foam at the mouth. This demon would cause the boy while he was seizing to either roll into a fire and burn him to death or roll into a water and drown him. Jesus healed this young man of this demon. Now the priests and sorcerers of demons were even more possessed by these spirits. They had given themselves over entirely and lived as puppets for these demons. And so 2,000 years ago, we see entire cultures being possessed and oppressed by these spirits. Even Israel opened the door to these other gods. And then the lights went out. Darkness again covered the face of the earth, but this time it wasn't a lack of sunlight, it wasn't a solar eclipse, it was spiritual darkness over the eyes of people. But what happened? Where are these gods and spirits? Where are the gods of the Romans, the Greeks, the Babylonians? What happened to them? Why aren't they as prevalent or as commonly seen today in recent history? What occurred 2,000 years ago that would cause these demons to leave? Friends, I gotta tell you, what occurred better be said is who occurred, and his name was Jesus Christ. And 2,000 years ago, he took away the power of death, hell, and the grave, and he conquered the Shadim forever and ever. Amen. 1 John 3, 8 says, the one who practices sin is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus left perfect heaven and brought the light of God with him so he could save the world from darkness for both now and all eternity. When Jesus died on the cross, he absorbed all sin with him so we don't have to carry it any longer. Not just when we get to heaven, but while we live on earth. We get to experience all the pleasure of life on earth with none of the pain. Wherever we go, we spread the light of God and where the light of God is, darkness cannot overpower it. On our phones, we see this all the time. On our phones, all of us have the ability to create a flashlight. But if it were too dark and we couldn't see, immediately we can bring forth the light to expel the darkness. Flashlights have been around for ages. Do you know what invention will never be made? It's called a flash dark. There will never be anything called a flash dark. Why? Because darkness can never overpower light, but only light can overpower darkness. When Jesus Christ shows up, the devil goes running, darkness goes running, demons go begging for mercy because the light overpowers the darkness. Don't get it twisted. There has never been, nor will there ever be, a flash dark because the light is more powerful. John 8, 12 says that Jesus is the light of the world. Wherever Jesus went, demons begged him for mercy. Some demons even begged him to be sent into pigs. They were that desperate. Everywhere Jesus went, he healed and delivered people from spirits that held them captive. The light expelled the darkness. Jesus brings light and life. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. One by one, Jesus delivered people from darkness. And they began to worship God and discover their purpose and experience life in the fullest. Then he gave authority to the, the disciples, to the church, to preach the word of God and cast out spirits. They were filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to drive out the forces of darkness. But as we know, demons won't leave just because you ask nicely. Demons won't believe because they get bored. Demons will only leave if they get cast out, if they get driven out. That's why in the book of Acts 16, we see a demon-possessed woman stalking the apostle Paul. And it's not until Paul turns to her and casts the demon out that she's free. But then the entire city seeks to go and arrest Paul and execute Paul because the demons of that region knew that their time was up. 
Early Christians were persecuted, thrown to the lions in the Colosseums, not because of culture or politics, but because they did not worship the gods of Rome. But in the end, friends, I've got to tell you, the power of the gospel prevailed. Today, the temples of Zeus are empty. The shrine of Dionysus is empty. The Greek pantheon is nothing more than a tourist photo attraction. But do you know what's full? The church of Jesus Christ is full with saints, full with believers, full with people. Friends, the ways of the demons are empty and the ways of God are full for thousands of years. Can I get an amen this morning in the house of God? But spirits don't die. They don't have physical bodies, so what happens to them? That leads us to the final part of the mystery. Jesus told this parable to explain in Matthew uh, chapter 12, verses 43 through 45. He says, now when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but it will not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and takes along with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. This is the way it will be with this evil generation. Jesus says the latter state will be worse than the first. That once you kick a demon out, if you don't fill it with the spirit of God, he comes back with a vengeance. Some people think that it's only talking about people. Some people think Jesus is only mentioning humans, about the human soul. But Jesus himself says at the end, this is how it will be with this wicked generation. So it's not only individuals that can be possessed, but entire cultures, nations, generations can be possessed. They can be delivered and they can be repossessed. Friends, it's a dangerous thing when a nation turns its back on God. Look at Russia. Russia was a predominantly Christian nation that built beautiful churches. They were building magnificent churches and it stopped in the year 1917. Little history lesson, who knows what took place in Russia in the 1917? The communist revolution. Communism took over. Historical critics say communism is humanism or secularism, but I believe it's demonic. How do I know this? Up until World War II, Stalin and Lenin would kill and imprison religious leaders and Christians in order to get them to leave their past ways and embrace science and humanism. He would round up all the grandmothers of the villages. Back then in Russian culture, the grandmas were the ones who would lead the family in prayer, lead the family in worship, lead the family to church. It was the elderly generation that kept them rooted in God. So Stalin got them all in boxcars, drove them away, and had them executed. Friends, science doesn't call for the killing of Christ followers. You know who does? Satan. Science does not call for Jesus Christ to be profaned. But you know who does? Satan. When a scientific ideology, when things people believe, they begin to target Christian schools, Christian people, and Christian churches. I know it's not science behind it. I know it's the devil. Because science doesn't call for the killing of Christians, but only Satan does, because he hates that we're made in the image of God. Look what happened to the land that gave us the Reformation, the land that gave us Protestantism, that we could have relationship with God. They went from being the bastion to godly connection to executing God's chosen people, the Israelites. Friends, an unsaved world can make barbarians, they can make pirates, they can even produce an emperor Nero. But a postmodernism world, a world that has known God but runs away, only that world can produce an Adolf Hitler. An unsaved world can produce villains, but a postmodernism world can produce evil. That when you turn your back on God, you invite in all these spirits. This is a warning to America and the modern world. Any person, culture, or nation that's been delivered from the spirits by the power of God and walked with God, if they should ever abandon God and leave him, if they empty their house of God's presence, the house won't stay empty. But that demon that was kicked out will want to come back with a vengeance. See, we've been known primarily as a Christian nation. Friends, you better believe that America didn't found Christianity, but Christianity founded America. Do not believe the lie that America was rooted on evil, that America was rooted on sin. America did not found Christianity, but Christianity was the lifeblood. It was the source. It was the inspiration. Our founding fathers penned right now in our legislation that we will serve God. We get our rights from God. America didn't found Christianity, but don't believe the lie that Christianity did not found and inspire this great country. Can I get an amen in the house of God this morning? The world will lie to you and say you were rooted on evil, but you say, no, no, no. We're rooted in the ways of God. Just because the truth sounds hateful to you doesn't mean it is. But God established this country like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, to shine the light of God's world, or God's word to the nations of the world, to be a lighthouse to a sea of darkness. But we've turned away from God. 
Friends, it saddens me to say this, but we as a nation, we as a people, we've gone to the door of our homes and our country, and we've opened the door for the demons just to walk right in. Demons can't come in, they have to be invited, they have to be welcomed, they have to be allowed to come in. It breaks my heart to say that we as people have opened the door, if it's slowly, even if it was a small creek, but we opened the door to these demons. These ancient gods from days of old have returned. They found the house swept clean. They found America nice, filled with prosperity. And they're repossessing the culture, the land, the people in America today. But who are these ancient gods? When Israel turned their back on God, these three gods were prevalent in their culture. They're known as the Dark Trinity. The same Dark Trinity is at work in America and the world. The first of which is a very common name we see in the Bible named Baal, the Possessor. The literal definition of Baal in Hebrew means master. Those who follow Baal are his slaves, his servants, his subjects. There's always a cost to serve a master. Baal always comes with a cost. Baal is so obsessed with you abandoning God and worshiping something else, he doesn't even want it to be him. He'll have you worship yourself. He'll have you put pride above God. He'll say, if you fear God, then you've done the wrong thing. People today will care more about how their image is perceived in society than honoring what God told them. We have people who fear God, not enough. The fear of God is lost on these people. A famous quote has said, if you fear God over man, you fear nothing. But if you fear man over God, you'll fear everything. When God tells you something, are you more concerned with how someone will look at you for saying it, or are you more concerned with honoring the word of Almighty God? Are you more concerned with God's image or your own image? Who's the master that you serve? Is it Baal, is it pride, or is it God? See, the Bible tells us that Baal caused Israel to forget God. America has forgotten God. Baal's whole agenda is to remove and replace, remove the one true God and replace God with something else, with himself, with the devil. And they wanna be praised themselves rather than praising God. They wants to see God kicked out of culture, education, government, media, sports, the marketplace, you name it. Anytime God is removed, he's replaced. But how did Baal get in? Well, friends, we had to open the door. Starting in the early 60s, we removed prayer from our schools. I'd be saying, what's the big deal? They can just pray later. They can just pray at their homes. But when you take God from the children, you take God from the future. When you remove a generation from knowing God, you remove a God from a generation. Abraham Lincoln said it best, we're one generation away from complete freedom or complete slavery. And when you take God away from a generation, there's no, more, there's no freedom. Because where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. In 1962, we have a history example for this. In 1962, prayer was taken out of schools. And 37 years later, April 1999, one generation later, the American youth faced the worst thing they've ever seen to that point that happened in a school. April 1999 was the date of the Columbine High School shooting. Friends, when a generation grows up without God, we see a generation do godless things. When a generation's raised without God, all we see is a godless generation. But when there's one God, there's only one truth. When you have many gods, you have many truths. Everybody has their own truth. People say, it might not be the truth, but it is my truth. I have my truth, you have your truth, and we'll coexist in truth. If a man says he's a woman, well, then it must be true. If a boy says he feels like a girl, well, then you know what? Sign him up with the family doctor. We've lost our minds. There was one symbol that signified Baal above all else. It was a massive bronze bull. Could this sign ever come back to America? What already has. It's right in New York City, the Wall Street Bull. This is a sign that a nation that once knew God but turned away from God opened the door to Baal to establish himself. We've turned from God to materialism. We saw this exact same scenario in the Bible twice before. The first time, the children of Israel are wandering in the wilderness. Moses has been on the mountain for 40 days and the people go to Aaron and say, make us a God that we might worship. The God that Aaron made was a calf, a young bull, a golden bull. We see it also again when King Ahab was king of Israel during the time of 1 Kings 18. He was leading the Israelites into worshiping Baal with the help of his wife Jezebel. But what's the Bible's answer, answer to Baal? What does the Bible have to say on how we overcome the demon of Baal? Friends, it was Elijah. 
the prophet of God. It was the spirit of the prophet Elijah, one of the last remaining followers of God in his day that went to war against the worshipers of Babylon at Mount Carmel. King Ahab invited all these idols into the culture and people were worshiping the images of Baal and not God. So the prophet Elijah calls for all the people of Israel to join him at Mount Carmel, along with 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. We're gonna pick up the story, 1 Kings 18, 21. Then Elijah stood right in front of them and said, how much longer will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people were silent. Friends, you'll find that majority of people are silent and they're just waiting for one person to stand up. One person to say the truth. That's why I'm so thankful for the spirit of Elijah. You know what Elijah does? He gets two bulls to be cut up for the sacrifice. One for the prophets of Baal and one for Elijah. He says, it's time to cut the bull. Come on, somebody. Sometimes as a church, you got to stand up and say, it is time to cut this bull and leave this right here. And Elijah says, you can call on your God, Baal, and I'll call on the name of the Lord. The one who answers by fire is the true God. And the story goes that the Baal worshipers go first. They begin to sing, they begin to dance, they begin to shimmy their way to try and summon Baal to do fire. They even begin to cut themselves over the fire as if that will appease Baal. Remember, Baal always comes with a cost. I love Elijah so much. Elijah reminds me of a Dream City Church member. Because while these people are parading themselves in front of Baal, Elijah says, perhaps he had too much Mexican food and he's in the bathroom. Perhaps Baal can't hear you because he had another burrito. Maybe you should give him some time. Elijah was an instigator. He was like Dream City Church. Come on, Dream City Church. Let me hear something from you. He knew the truth and he wasn't afraid to say it. But then Elijah steps up. And before he even says anything, he rebuilds an altar to God that had been abandoned. Years ago on that same mountain, there was an altar made to give glory to God. But over time, that same altar was abandoned and people had left God. Before Elijah says a word, before he performs a miracle, before he does anything, he prioritizes the connection with God. After re-inviting the worship of God for the people, Elijah then calls on God to send fire to the altar. Now, Elijah didn't ask for fire because he's a man and thinks fire is cool, although that might be a part of it. Elijah knows that in the Canaanite religion, Baal is the God of the rain and the harvest. That when the Israelites wanted a bigger harvest for their crops, they would turn to Baal because he was uh, cultural. He was, he was prosperity. He was all these things that people wanted. But friends, when we think of fire from the sky, we think of like a giant meteor, a giant fireball coming. But we see fire from the sky all the time in Arizona. You see, Baal was also known as the God of the storm, that he could bring forth a storm. He could bring all of these things forth in an instant. We see storms all the time, and the fire that comes from heaven is known as lightning. So literally, what I love about Elijah is he looks at the prophets of Baal, and he says, my God can beat your God at his own game. Your God claims he can summon fire from heaven, then you know what? That will be the test. The world says if you're depressed or you're anxious, smoke this joint or swallow this pill, but that only leaves them feeling worse than before. But God says if you cast all your burdens on me, you'll be made whole again. The world says if you want a healthy marriage, if you want to have a good marriage, then live before you get married. Have sex before you're married. But all that does, and the data proves this, is lead to a higher divorce rate. But God says, if you keep me first in marriage, there will not be an issue you can't overcome. The world says, if you want to have money, if you want to be prosperous, if you want to succeed, then don't give it away and don't start a family. Keep it for yourself. But that causes people to grow old, alone, and miserly. But God says, when you put me first, when you give to the kingdom, I will open up the windows of heaven and bring down a blessing so forward there's no room to contain it time and time again the world goes toe to toe with God and time and time again God's victorious come on Dream City Church let me hear something this morning Elijah says my God will beat your God at his own game the one who answers by fire and so God did it we'll pick up the story in 1 Kings 1839 When all the people saw the fire fall down from heaven, they fell face down on the ground. They cried out, the Lord, he is God. Yes, the Lord is God. Then Elijah called for all the prophets of Baal to be killed. He cleaned the house. He rebuilt the altar. He reestablished the priority of worshiping God first. Oh, Dream City Church, can I get an amen in the house of God this morning? Let me move quickly now to the second member of the Dark Trinity. This is a goddess. In Hebrew, she's called Asherah. In Greece, she was called Aphrodite. In Babylon, she was known as Ishtar. 
the seducer, the adulterer, the goddess of unbridled sexual immorality. When she comes into a culture, she sexualizes the culture. Another name for her in Greek is the goddess Pornea. Her literature was the very first pornography the world ever saw. Has this God returned to America? Friends, you better believe it. In the 60s, we have what was called the sexual revolution. But what really was was a turning away from God and being immersed in sexual perversion. We've moved from the age of the sexual revolution to the age of sexual confusion. This goddess says, I'm a woman or I'm a man. It said that she had the powers to turn a woman to a man and a man to a woman. When this goddess was worshipped, there were men dressed up as women and they would dance provocatively before the goddess of Ishtar. They would dance provocatively in front of Asherah poles, Ishtar poles. Friends, we see the same type of sexualized dancing in front of a pole in modern day. But it's not called an Asherah pole, friends. We call it a stripper pole. I remember being in university and they were teaching pole dancing lessons to both males and females. This demon has invaded culture yet again. The exact same demon, the exact same idea, just a different day. During the time period of 1 Kings 14, as Elijah was fighting the prophets of Baal, there was a plague inside the church. There were gay and bisexual men, prostitutes, who would wait outside the temple and be paid for by both men and women. Friends, that during this time, the sexual perversion and confusion, homosexuality had invaded the church. It's found its place in the church. Friends, we see this with some church denominations that have veered away from the truth of God. They have homosexual clergy. Not people who struggle with it, as people sin, but embracing that life of sexual perversion. See, this is the spirit that blurs the line of what is a man or what is a woman. This is the spirit that confuses people to the point where they can't even answer the question, what is a woman? Friends, we see that in culture a lot today. They don't know what is male and female, what's boy and girl. One of the ancient inscriptions says she grinds away the masculinity of men. Friends, if that doesn't sound like our culture, I don't know what does. We have a culture that hates men. That seeks to remove men from providers as husbands, as fathers. It seeks to remove men from authority and then it seeks to masculinize women. It seeks to turn women into men and to remove men altogether. This is what happens when a nation turns away from God. Kids now are being indoctrinated with the doctrines of demons through a public school system. We have men dressed as women reading children's books to our children at school. We have public school officials and governors of states giving authority to doctors to mutilate children without the consent of their parents because they're convinced the child wasn't born with the correct parts. We can throw, one, we can throw Psalm 139, 14 out the window that we were fearfully and wonderfully made because if someone's confused, well, then they must be. Friends, as we depart from the word of God, we'll see chaos and mayhem in the streets around us. Even unbelievers are rising up and saying, this is insane. This doesn't make any sense. But Ishtar was also a goddess of parades. She had one month in the year where she was especially possessed the culture. Friends, it's probably no surprise to take a guess as to what month that is today. It was the month of June. We're not even making this up. June has become reoccupied. Joe Biden signed into law that in June is now to be Pride Month. It's in the law that June will be Homosexual Community Pride Month. Ishtar was also linked to a sign. I'm um, sure you can guess her sign. It was the rainbow. President Biden issued a proclamation calling all Americans to wave their flags of pride on high. But friends, I gotta tell you, the rainbow doesn't belong to a movement. It doesn't belong to a president. The rainbow belongs to God Almighty. <laughs> friends, I'm telling you, the rainbow we see is a counterfeit rainbow. It's not the same as the word of God. And I'm believing and praying for the day where we see a return where the rainbow doesn't mean gay pride, but the rainbow means God loves me so much. He's going to save me and save me for eternity. Oh, friends, we're going to see the rainbow come back to be for God. Amen. Friends, that's why we're doing what we're doing, because the devil's after our kids. That's why we're building these next gen buildings for the kids and the youth. That's why we have kids' ministry, youth ministry. Go and volunteer in one of them. Go and sow in those seeds. That's why we have summer camps, Dream City School, Dream City College. We're not going to allow the devil to have our kids. Not at Dream City Church. You can best believe he's not going to have my son. Not in this lifetime. That leads me to the final member of our trinity. He's known as Moloch the Destroyer. This is the spirit that caused parents to offer up their own children as sacrifices. When Israel turned away from God, they started offering up their own children to this demon. The pagan world was filled with child sacrifice. It wasn't a safe place for children. 
Has this God returned to America? Absolutely, and with a vengeance. Make no mistake about it, the 60s was Baal and Ishtar, but the 70s was where we opened the door to Molech. The spirit came back with seven other spirits. Israel offered up thousands of children to be sacrificed. We as Americans have offered up 64 million. Some of you might be wondering why we were lighting these candles every 30 seconds. That was intentional. Because in America, every 30 seconds, one child is aborted. Friends, every 30 seconds, we have a child offered up on the altar of Molech. As I've been preaching, we've had this many. That just breaks my heart. But friends, that's why I'm so thankful that we had people in office who overturned Roe v. Wade. That's why I'm so thankful that America drew a line in the sand and said, you will have no more souls, no more babies, no more sacrifices to Molech from this day forward. We have seen revival. But friends, how many of us know that the, the battle's not over? The demons, they won't go out willing. They have to be cast out. That's why we have a march for life on March 1st at the Capitol. That's why we do what we do. But the way we defeat this spiritual enemy once and for all is not only by exercising these demons, but filling ourselves with the Spirit of God. By being like King Josiah. King Josiah became king when he was eight. And 18 years into his reign, he was 26. He sent his chief scribe to the temple to find money to rebuild the temple. But he came out with the book of the law of Moses. And after reading what was in it, he began to just weep. And he saw how his ancestors and how he himself had allowed Israel to come into sin. And he made the decision that for no longer shall he tolerate sin. And he went against it. Josiah was willing to do what was unpopular in the world's eyes to establish what was right in God's eyes. Josiah was willing to be man's fool so he could be God's mouthpiece. Josiah was willing to say that there are two genders. Josiah was willing to say that God made them male and female, that marriage is between a man and a woman. God, uh, Josiah was willing to say what was unpopular because he glorified God. Josiah feared God more than he feared men. How many of us need a revival of the King Josiah spirit this morning? We say man can hurt me for a moment, but I'd much rather fear God who has my soul for all eternity. Josiah feared God more than he feared man, so he feared no one. Friends, we've seen this spirit again. We see this in another country. There was a, an election in El Salvador, a country that 10 years ago was the murder capital of the world. They elected a man named Nayib Bukele, who swiftly dealt with crime, locked up evil, and dedicated his country to God. He won the most recent landslide with a 90%, he won this election with a 90% landslide victory. And at his acceptance speech, he said something so profound. He looked at the people who were no doubt tired of the victory they had, and he looked at them and said, what an honor it is to be an instrument of God. What an honor it is that God would choose us. What an honor it is that God would use us. Friends, too many times we view the word of God as a burden, the challenge of God as a burden, that having that conversation to address sin, we view it as a burden, but no longer shall it be a burden, but it will be an honor that God would use us. Friends, what an honor it is to be an instrument of God. When we read scriptures in the Bible, we think, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> How could they re rebel against God? They've seen firsthand his glory. They've seen firsthand his provision. They've seen the prosperity. How could they rebel against God? Friends, a lot of us have wished to be in Bible times. Well, congratulations, now we are. <laughs> Friends, the same demons, the same issues, but a brand new day. What an honor it is to be an instrument of God. In the five years President Bukele has been president, El Salvador went from being the most dangerous country in the world to the safest country in all of Latin America. The safest country in all of Latin America because he feared God and not feared man. But friends, what do we do? How do we kick out these demons? Well, I can't think of anything better than first and foremost grabbing this door and literally shutting it completely and saying, devil, you aren't allowed in this country no more. You're not allowed in my life, not allowed with my family, not allowed with my son, my wife, my school, my education, my media. You're not allowed here anymore. Devil, you get out. We can shut the door on doom and gloom. Shut the door on your past. You don't have to live as a prisoner to your past. You might have made a mistake. We all have. But God's mercies renew every day. And he covers a multitude of sins. Shut the door. Secondly, friends, we have to look at the idols that we've seen. Look at what we've made. Look at all these idols. And we have to begin to pick them up and just cast them out and say, you will not have a place here any longer. We've got to go and find all these altars. Pick them up like Josiah and throw them down and say, you've had your day, but your day's over. This country was founded by Jesus Christ of the living God. And my son will see it be that way when he's older. As long as I'm breathing, my son will know that Jesus Christ and God gets the glory. How 
Church, can you say an amen to God? Oh, come on. That's why we do what we do. Now we can see a generation come up to know the ways of God. And then after we've torn down those altars, friend, it's a time we rebuild, just like Elijah. Reestablish the priority of being in church. I remember being a teenager and saying, Mom, I wanna watch football, not go to church, and she dragged me. She said, if you don't, your dad will. I said, I'm coming, okay. <laughs> she reestablished the priority of being in church. She reestablished the idea. We have men's prayer every Tuesday morning at six <clears throat> because I refuse to let the world outwork me for God. I refuse, the world parties all night, does drugs all night, has sex all night. I refuse to let that stop me from serving God. I want my son to grow up and be shocked that there are men and dads out there who don't wake up early to pray. I want my son to only know of a man who wakes up to pray for God. Come on, somebody. We've got men's prayer, we've got women's prayer. Put God first in your family, and then last but certainly not least, each of us is made in the image of God, and God himself is light. Each of us carries a light. Each of us is called to be a lighthouse that stands at the top of a hill, that stands not so we blind people, not so people can't see, but so they can see, so they don't crash, so they don't burn, so they don't run into each other. If a lighthouse were to go out, the ships would panic. They'd crash into each other. They'd crash into the harbor. They're trying to make it. Friends, when you carry forward the light of God, you make it so the world can see clearly what's ahead of it. We carry the light of God. When you do the will of Jesus, you spread the light of God. When you say, I'm sorry, when you say, I forgive you, when you clothe the naked, when you feed the hungry, the world gets a little bit brighter. The torch has been passed to you. Now shine your light. It's up for us to win this generation for God. God gave us full authority to drive out demons. We just need to move in that authority. Sometimes I do this thing, not because of my own life, but I have an extra motivation that pushes me forward. There's something else that pushes me forward. There are things in my life that get hard. I don't wanna say I'm sorry sometimes because I can be stubborn. I don't wanna get up and change a diaper. Let's just be honest, come on somebody. But there are things in my life I do not because of me, because of someone else behind me. I want my son to grow up and see America the way it was supposed to be. I want my wife to be able to shop safely, to live a life safely and enjoy all that life has to offer. I'm gonna close with this scripture. One of the most powerful exchanges in the whole Bible occurs in the Gospel of Luke, chapter one, verse 19. The high priest of the time, Zechariah, goes into the Holy of Holies to encounter God. But while he's there, the angel Gabriel stands before him and says, hey, Zechariah, I've heard your prayer and you will have a son. And Zechariah's like, oh, that's cool, but how do I know this will be true? I'm pretty old. Gabriel looks at him confused. He says, I stand in the presence of God. This world will come to pass. As I read that verse, I was convicted because I realized there will be a day where I too stand in the presence of God. I have to give an account for every aspect of my life, things the world sees and things no one's seen that I've done in the dark. Where God's gonna look at me and say, I gave you my daughter as a bride, how did you treat her? I gave you my inheritance as a son, how did you raise him? I put you in the land of America, a land that I founded, how did you steward it? Did you consecrate it for me? Friends, this is a powerful scripture because it realizes to all of us one day we too will stand in the presence of God. And I wanna get up there with no regrets and say, God, I did all I could. I feared you over man. I was willing to be a fool. I got made fun of because I wanted you to get the glory. Jesus said it himself, not my will, but thy will. But friends, these demons are real, but so too is the God we serve. At some point in eternity, all creation, angels, demons, and humans will stand before God. So make the decision today to follow the words of Joshua in Joshua 24, 15, where he says, choose from yourselves today who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. Amen. Friends, we're gonna serve the Lord. The next generation is God's inheritance, and that is who we fight for. That's who we believe for.
as I watch this program today. You know, I've been with you 44 years at this church. And when we came to this church 44 years ago, there were 200 people. And then the next generation came along, and that's Luke. And the church is exploding now into the greatest years it's ever had. But then today, we saw a young man in his middle 20s stand up here and boldly proclaim that these old idols will not help us in America. And we got to stand for God. How many appreciate that? Wasn't that great? And then, of course, we got to look at the next generation when he brought up his kid. Amen. Little Joe, Joe Oates, I mean, uh, Joe Matisse. And folks, there's hope. And you are the hope of the world. Of course, the great hope of the world is him. But he lives within you now. 
And our job is to preserve this generation and the next generation. And the way that we live now will depend how the next generation, and if there's ever a time that the church needs to be strong, it is right now where we live. Can you hear a good amen for that right now? And that's what the conference is all about. And that's why you got to be here every single night. That's why you need to take off work if you can. Be here during the daytime. This is about seeing America come to God and see America saved for the glory of God. But just before I close, there are some of you out there who are saying, well, I didn't have a mom and dad like you did, Pastor Barnett, who loved God, who came from a generation that loved God. My parents did not love God. They did not come from a generation that loved God. They might have believed in Him, but they didn't live for Him. But my call to you tonight is to put the ax to the root of that generation. Somewhere it's got to stop. And it's got to stop with you today. Come on, say a good amen. So while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, no one is moving from this building. God has moved upon hearts of people today. People who said, I'm not going to let the devil drive my life. I'm going to drive him out completely. And by the way, he cannot dwell in the same temple that a child of God dwells. So the way you get Satan out of your life is to put somebody stronger in you. And greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So all, every head is bowed. Listen, it just hit me today when I was driving to church for no other reason. Maybe you don't feel the need of coming to Christ. You don't think that you need God. Why don't you just do it for your children? Why don't you do it for your wife? They need a man of God who loves God. Mother, why don't you do it for your children? Because nobody goes into hell alone. We take people with us or we take them away from it. So while every head is bowed, I believe God's about to give us one of the greatest calls we ever had. And I'm going to ask everybody in this building who will say, Pastor, I don't want to be a part of this old society that we heard about today. I want to clean the house out. My family is for me and my family. We're going to serve God. So while every head is bowed, I want everyone in this building to raise your hand when I ask you to who will say, Pastor, I need God and I need Him bad. And this morning is going to be the time that I take the ax and I put it to the root of generational curses forever. And we're going to start a new generation in our family. Every head bowed, every eye closed. How many will put your hand up and say, Pastor, I need God and my family needs God. Pray for me, Pastor. I'm going to pray for you. Raise your hand all over this building. Come on, put them up all over this auditorium. Hundreds of hands are going up. Keep raising them right now. Give a testimony. You're going to serve God. And you're going to serve Him well. I'm going to stay, go a step further. The Bible said that we must be willing not to be shamed before man. I'm going to ask every one of you that raised your hand to step out and come and stand right before me. And I'm going to pray for you at this altar. Come on, everyone. Come on, this is a day that we're going to bury the old life and we're going to accept the new life. Come on, come on, all over this altar. Get as close as you can. Keep coming right now. Father, why don't you bring the family with you right now? Mother, why don't you bring your daughter with you right now? Church, why don't you begin to clap and praise God? Look at this. Look at this altar call. I want you to clap as long as they come. I want you to clap as if this were your son or daughter. I want you to praise God with a shout and a clap. As this is your mother or your father. Or your, come on, church. Let's celebrate right now. Hallelujah. Move as close as you can. Oh, come on. Let's begin to raise our hands of 
praise God for what's taking place right now. Begin to raise your hands and praise God. said that if we will confess our sins that he'll forgive us it was for this moment that God sent his son it was for this moment that Jesus hung on that cross and he bled and he died there's nothing greater than committing yourself to this cause so while every head is bowed, I'm going to ask everyone standing at the front to join me in this simple prayer. I want everyone in this audience to join in that prayer, even though you know Christ, to encourage these that are about to pray the prayer. And by the way, there may be somebody beside you that raised their hand. And maybe they didn't, but they need the Lord. Maybe it's just put your hand on the shoulder beside them right now as we all pray this prayer together. I want it to sound like thunder, loud and strong. Everybody repeat this prayer. Dear God, I need a Savior. I need help, God. I need forgiveness. And you said if I would ask you that you would forgive me. And I ask you, Lord, I repent of my sins and I now give my life to you. You are now my Savior. You are my Lord. You are my God. And I'm going to serve you and live for you. In Jesus' name. Come on, raise your hands and give the Lord a good clap offering right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. close your eyes. Father, I pray for every family in this church. Lord, I pray for that son or daughter that's not living for God. If you've got one, put your hand up right now. Hold it up to God. Maybe put two hands up. We pray, God, that you will arrest them wherever they are. We pray their souls will be saved and they'll escape an eternal hell. Today, dear Lord, we stand for our families. And I pray, God, that this church will remain strong and will do everything we can to see their families come to God. Today, we want to thank you for what you've done for us, Lord. Would you just put your hands up, everybody? And in your own words, just say, thank you, Jesus. Could I hear a roar of prayer just across us? We thank you, Lord. We worship you. We adore you. Well, we're going to sing that song one more time, but just before we do, we have one more important business to take care of. After this service in our baptistry outside, we're going to be baptized. All of you that came to be baptized, but look, I want every one of you that just accepted Christ. The Bible said a Immediately they were baptized in water. Well, Pastor, I'm waiting for Uncle Frank to come up from Tucson to see me be baptized. No, this is not recital. This is obedience. And the first act of obedience after you're saved is to be baptized in water. Now, we have a change of clothes for you. We've got a t-shirt. We got everything that you need. 
I don't know where to get it. Luke, maybe you'll come up or send somebody. Tell them where to go get it, okay? But we'll help you. All you need to have is a change of heart. So do it today. Seal what has taken place in your life by telling the world, I'm not ashamed. I'm going to bury the old life and I'm going to live for God. Come on, give the Lord a good clap on it. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Amen. Aren't you glad? And Walt, we're not going to sprinkle them either. We're going to put them under. Amen. We're going to sing this real one more time. In this beautiful song. You know what? I dedicate you. Who else up here did I dedicate? Yeah, dedicated him when there's a baby. And now I Oh, they got babies. Hi, honey. You girls are sure pretty. Aren't they beautiful? Got a girl. Give our children a good hand. They is a good hand. Oh, then I just can't. Just don't push me. Please don't push me. Sing it one more time. We'll see you at the water baptismal today. Let's all go out there, stand around. And don't forget tomorrow night, the rockets you are going to go off on this place, all right? Sing it together as we move on.